Hunt. We support uh, Central African Baptist College in Zambia. And that is a, that is a college that he began, and uh, it's in the country of Zambia. That sort of thing. Speaking of breakfast, yesterday morning, fellas, let me just tell you, at the Grace Building, we had breakfast Amen. to the glory of God. I want to say thanks to Carlos for organizing that. And Carl, who's gone on a little trip, he helped. But uh, Carlos got that together, so thank you. And we had 25 men that came to the Grace Building yesterday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. Does 7 o'clock exist on a Saturday? Yes, yes it does. <laughs> yes. And of course, uh, Brian gets there and opens it up, gets the tech all set up. But it was a good, it was a good group of men, good fellowship, good food, and we have another breakfast coming up this Saturday. So, men, listen, don't knock yourself for not being there if you weren't there. You have another opportunity of grace this coming Sunday, uh, Saturday, Saturday, okay, at the Grace Building, Grace Building, opportunity for grace, uh, seven o'clock in the morning, and then it'll be another thirty days when we have our next one, okay. By the way, guys, if you were there yesterday, you know how wonderful it was. You invite somebody to come with you, right? And, uh, and bring them. It'll impact their life. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, if you would. We're going to talk about Jesus. Uh, we always talk about Jesus, right? <laughs> That's nothing new. We'll always talk about Jesus. Listen, if you don't talk about Jesus, and you're in a, you're in a Christian church, then uh, you're not preaching the Christ honoring message. You always got to be preaching about Jesus because it all Bible's about Jesus. We're going to talk about Jesus and the Old Testament today. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. I appreciate Julie introducing us to our passage. Let's read us. Uh, let's read that again for us this morning. Do not think, starting at Matthew 5, verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Father, open your word to us today by your Holy Spirit. And if there's someone that doesn't know Jesus, may they come to know Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you a question. What if someone came to you and told you that the Old Testament is no longer important? It wasn't really needed. For New Testament Christians. Yeah, how would you respond to that? That's rhetorical. You don't have to ask. Okay. I remember growing up in Sunday school and in BBS, Vacation Bible School. And I remember growing up and learning the stories of Scripture out of the Old Testament. So, you know, the story about Adam and Eve, our first parents, and how they fell. The story about Cain and Abel, right? One brother kills another. And judgment that happens. And, and the story about Noah and the great flood. And the story about the Tower of Babel. Remember that one? Okay. All these stories out of the law of God. And then you get into some of the historical writings and you read about David and Goliath. So many different stories out of the Old Testament. Elijah and Elisha, the great prophets, right? Elisha follows Elijah. Elijah goes up in a whirlwind. And so we, we, we remember these stories of you're up in church. How about Daniel and the lion's den? How many of y'all have flannel graph and Daniel and the lion's den? Anybody okay? So all, some of you remember, remember old school flannel graph. Okay, that's great stuff. Still works, by the way. Now, a lot of times these stories were taught for uh, moral and ethical reasons and didn't always connect the dot to Jesus Christ when it's being taught. But at least those who taught the stories had a high regard for the Old Testament scripture. Okay, so it's good to be taught. In, in 2018, just last year, Andy Stanley, pastor of North Point Community Church, just north of us in Georgia, appealing to people who had left the church and the faith they grew up with said, and I quote, the Christians need to unhitch the Old Testament from their faith. Ah, 
okay? And he was dealing with people who had grown up in the church, didn't like some of the stories, the things they had read in the Old Testament, maybe they had gone to college and had their faith picked apart because of some different things, uh, you know, out of the Old Testament, and so they had abandoned their faith, and so that was his point. Uh, but he pretty much belabored the point pretty strongly, Christians need to unhitch the Old Testament from their faith. I would disagree with that. We don't need to unhitch from the Old Testament as New Testament Christians. We need, to, we, we need to understand that Jesus valued the Old Testament and taught it. Okay? What do you think the scriptures were that he was teaching and reading from? The apostles valued the Old Testament and alluded to it, often quoted from it, based on what they wrote in the light of Christ, but based on what they wrote out of the Old Testament scriptures. The writer of Hebrews valued the Old Testament. I mean, you can't have the book of Hebrews unless you've got the Old Testament. I mean, it's a foundation for the entire book of Hebrews. The Old Testament fulfilled in Christ. Jesus is the better this, that, and the other in Hebrews. And even the prophetic book of Revelation is rooted in the Old Testament. You're going to come up with all sorts of weird ideas if you just read the book of Revelation. If you read the Old Testament and read the book of Revelation, you'll go, oh, I see. Okay, it's rooted in the Old Testament ideas and, and, and uh, prophetic writings. So we don't want to destroy the foundations. We don't want to disregard the gospel in the Old Testament. In southern Oklahoma, whenever you're driving down I-35 corridor going down into Texas, Whenever you're going from Oklahoma down into Texas, you have to go through the Arbuckle Mountains, and, and you can look at these uh, these big rock cliffs, you know, sheared off rock cliffs, and you can see where they drilled holes way down deep and stuffed the TNT way down in there, and then just blasted the mountain apart, just just blasting it apart so they could create a road to go through the mountain. And some people just want to blast the foundation of the Old Testament and rip it out of uh, our conversation in the New Testament church. That's not needed at all. You think about this, this hurricane that's way out in the ocean right now, getting closer. And whenever there's a threat of a massive storm like that, it kind of shakes us just inwardly in our core. And our foundation feels threatened. I mean, everything that we're used to starts to feel, oh, you know, we can change. Foundations should not be removed. And definitely in the scripture, if you look at your Bible, you look at this book, and the New Testament is this much, right? And the, and the Old Testament is this much, and we're supposed to disregard the Old Testament? All the scripture, listen to this, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament is about Jesus. What is the entire Bible about? What's it about? It's all about Jesus. Entire scripture, all the news is about Jesus. So we're going to learn today about Jesus and the Old Testament. And the first thing we want to learn is this. Write this down. All of the Old Testament laws and prophecies lead us to Jesus. All of the Old Testament laws and prophecies lead us to Jesus. He said in verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Hold your finger there. Turn over to 2 Timothy, if you would. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 3. I hear some pages rustling, some phones being scrolled. Okay, 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And in verses 15 and 16, he's talking to uh, Timothy. He says, how, verse 15 of chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3, 15. And how from childhood, Timothy, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. What's he talking about? Not the New Testament. He's talking about what we call the Old Testament. Okay? To them, it wasn't the Old Testament. It was the scriptures, the sacred writings. You've been... You've been acquainted with these sacred writings from childhood, Timothy, which, now look at this, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. Oh, okay, Paul. So you're saying that the sacred writings, the Old Testament scriptures, actually make us wise for salvation. 
that they, they teach the gospel of Jesus. Well, that's interesting. In verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness. And he goes on. Do not discard the Old Testament. Don't do it. Jesus didn't. Matter of fact, he says in verse 17 that he did not come to abolish, or as one writer puts it, annul or discard the Old Testament law and prophets. He did not, he did not advocate throwing out the old writings to usher in the new. That's how we said I didn't come to do that. Jesus is, however, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament writings. And he even said as much. He said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. The one source talking about the word fulfill, verse 17, it is to cause God's will as made known in the law to be obeyed. So to cause God's will to be obeyed as it should be and God's promises, which were given to the prophets, to receive fulfillment. So Jesus is saying, I came to fulfillment. Here's the law of God. I came to do it. I came to implement it. And, and the prophecies that were given, I came to make sure they came to pass, that they received uh, fulfillment in me. Listen to this. Until you understand that all of Scripture points to Jesus, you're going to miss the point. Now, I want you to think about the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So, the, so, the, so the, the poor man Lazarus had all these sores all over his body, and the dogs came and licked the sores on Lazarus' body, and Lazarus sat by the rich man's gate. The rich man walked by him every day, and, and, and eventually the rich man dies, right? Lazarus dies, and Lazarus goes to what is called Abraham's bosom, comes into the presence of God. The rich man is in hell, and he's in torment, and he prays. He looks out and sees Father Abraham, Abraham, just send somebody to give me a, a drop of water. I'm in torment in this flames that we can't. There's a can't do that. And by the way, there's a great gulf between us. I can't, we can't cross that divide. It just can't happen. Oh, well, I've got five brothers, he cries out to Father Abraham. i got five brothers that are still alive. Call somebody and go to them. And tell them, warn them, that this place is real. And they trust in the word of God and trust in Christ. Him. Abraham says, leave it if somebody rises from the dead and not going to listen. Because they have, listen to this, the point of it. Because they have Moses and the prophets. And if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets and thus come to faith in the Messiah, they're not going to listen to somebody even if they rise from the dead. Do you see that? Jesus is teaching this story about rich man Lazarus, and his point is this. Hey, Jewish people, you've got the law of God, Moses, and you've got the prophets, you've got the Old Testament scriptures, and it all points to me. And you will end up in a Christless eternity unless you see that and you trust in me. That's his point. All of the Old Testament scripture points to Jesus. So God's word is eternal. Never to be discarded, never to be considered irrelevant, never to end up in the ash heap of history, even when it says down to the smallest stroke of a stylus or a pen in the Hebrew language. All will be accomplished in Christ. The one source talking about that word accomplished just simply means to come to pass, to make it happen. Jesus says, not even the smallest little markings in the Hebrew language that wrote the Old Testament, it, none, none of that, none of that law, is ever going to be gone. It's going to be fulfilled in me. Remember the story where um, after Jesus rose from the dead and he, he appeared incognito. Remember that? He's walking on the road to Emmaus. He catches up with these two disciples. And he doesn't let them, let, let them in on the secret that it's Jesus, the risen Christ, walking with them. Somehow he veils his identity. And so they're walking along, and these guys are, uh, you know, upset. They're like, we can't believe this happened. Jesus is like, oh, what's happening? You know, what, what's going on? Now, are you the only one in all of Palestine, in all this area, that doesn't know what just happened? Jesus, we put our hope in him, and he died and was buried. And Jesus, wow, he's just walking alongside these guys, listening to them, discouraged and depressed. Jesus let them down. They hoped he was the Messiah, but he was crucified. Listen, 
Listen to this in Luke 24. And Jesus said to them, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, that's the Messiah, should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Listen. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all, in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. <laughs> to the resurrected Christ appearing to these two disciples who are discouraged and depressed, and he's like, guys, you're so slow to get it. You got Moses, you got the prophets, and all, you, they all were talking about what has just happened. How can you not see that to be true? Later in that same chapter, we read Jesus appears to the rest of his disciples and he, and he said to them, starting verse 44, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me, where, where, where was it written about you? In the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, which is a way of saying the entire Old Testament scripture must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah, Christ, should suffer. Uh, this, he said it was written in the Old Testament. That's what he's saying. The Psalms, the Prophets, and Moses, the law. It was written that the Christ should suffer on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus took the Old Testament, the entire Testament, very, very seriously. And we would unhitch from the Old Testament? I think not. Write this down. Jesus came as the fulfillment of all that Moses wrote in the law of God. Straightforward, since that's what we're talking about here, but I want you to actually wrap your mind around that. Jesus came as the fulfillment of all that Moses wrote in the law of God. And so if you just go read through the first five books of the Bible, and you'll see some of these things that I'll present. Jesus is the agent of creation through whom all things were spoken into existence. Jesus is the seed of the woman who would someday have his heel struck by the serpent and would crush the serpent's head in victory. Jesus is the ark of safety in whom we find deliverance from the flood of God's coming wrath over sin. Jesus is the better Abraham, the leader of God's beloved covenant family. Jesus is the seed of Abraham through whom the whole world would be blessed. It's all what you're going to find in Moses and in his writings. Jesus is a better priest than Aaron. He's a priest after the priesthood of Melchizedek, whom God offered up as uh, this priest, whom God offered up as the perfect sacrificial lamb from heaven, thus removing the sin and guilt for all who trust in him. It, Jesus is the better deliverer. Moses came along as a deliverer of God's people out of Egypt. They were in bondage. Jesus is the greater deliverer than Moses, who came to deliver sinners all across time and across the world. Who would put their faith in him. He's the better son of the law who actually obeys everything demanded in the law of God and to whom everything in the law points. So all of God's law, all of the first five books is about Jesus. I want you to, I want you to get into Moses' perspective for just a second. God's people, they've been wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. And Moses is reiterating the law to them and writing a few other things in the book of Deuteronomy. This is a preparatory book for the new generation of God's people. The old one is about to die off, and the new generation is about to come in. Moses is about to die. He can't go into the promised land. He writes the second iteration of the law, Deuteronomy. That's what it means, second law. And so he's writing this, this book to remind them and prepare them for going into the promised land. So just before his death, Moses writes this. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. It might seem a bit innocuous, a big, big word, like unimportant, something you can just gloss over and just keep reading. It's not. Okay. This actually becomes huge in the mind of the Jewish nation. There's a prophet coming. 
as our deliverer, the one we're supposed to hear and listen, who will deliver his people. The Lord God will raise up the new prophet like me from among you, he says. And so fast forward into New Testament times, and Peter is now preaching in the temple, reminding Jewish people of the Messianic prediction in Deuteronomy 18 about the prophet that was going to come after Moses. <laughs> And he applies it to Jesus. In Acts chapter 3, verse 22 says, Moses said, this is Peter preaching, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it'll be that if every, that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And he's preaching about Jesus. Stephen. Stephen preaching at his trial before the Sanhedrin and included a reminder of the Messianic prediction given by Moses in Deuteronomy 18, the same passage, and it pointed to Jesus. And so Stephen says this in Acts chapter 7, verse 37. And this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Listen. Don't disregard the Old Testament. Jesus didn't disregard the Old Testament. The apostles didn't disregard the Old Testament. The New Testament writers did not disregard the Old Testament. But in their preaching, these first preachers, these early preachers, went back to the law of God and said, this, this prophecy over here is fulfilled in this man over here who brought us the new covenant, Jesus. He is the prophet in the line of Moses. So write this in your notes. Not only did Jesus come as the fulfillment of all Moses wrote in the law of God, but write this down, Jesus came as the focus of all the predictions written by the prophets of God. Jesus said, I don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So he came as the focus of all the predictions written by the prophets of God. Jeremiah, let me just give you an example. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and verse 34. Prophet Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And then he goes on and says in verse 34, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So Jeremiah is prophesying that there is going to be this person that comes on the scene who is going to establish a new covenant. For those of you who might be a little bit younger in the faith, what do I mean when I'm talking about new covenant, old covenant, Old Testament, New Testament? Okay. The Old Testament or the Old Covenant is the covenant at Sinai, the Mount Sinai, where Moses received the law of God. It is the Old Covenant. It is the Old Testament. And, and, and all of the Old Testament scriptures are wrapped around and flowing out of the Torah, the first five books of Moses. Okay? And so when Jeremiah comes along, Jeremiah is a prophet under the Old Covenant. He's operating under the law of Moses. And yet under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he says, hey, y'all people out there, God's people who have completely messed this up. And some of y'all are going to judge, and the rest of us are going to be judged, and everything's going to be destroyed. You're going to go into exile. It's going to be absolutely horrible. But I'm telling you, there is a new covenant coming by a new covenant person. There's somebody coming on the scene, and he is going to establish a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. He's going to forgive iniquity. He's going to remember sin no more. There's somebody coming! Amen. Jesus came along and he preached and he said, hey, uh, don't think that I came to abolish the prophets. Don't think that I'm switching gears and say, forget about what the prophets said. I came to actually fulfill what the prophets said. He came to bring in the new covenant. We won't read it, but if you want to write it down and look it up later, you can. The writer of Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 8, verse 6 through 13, that Jesus is the one that Jeremiah was talking about. Who is going to bring in the new covenant? So that's, Jer that's Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. You want to read that later. So whenever you read through the Old Testament prophets or even the book of Revelation, a guiding truth has to be in the forefront of your mind. You ready for it? You read through the Old Testament prophets, you read through the book of Revelation. Listen, Jesus is the point of every prophecy. Okay? 
is the point that the book of Revelation is what? The revelation of Jesus. I mean, uh, that, that's, I think, a little clear, right? Pastor Bob, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty clear. It's all about Jesus. As a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, it says, Then I, John, fell down at his feet, this angel, to worship him. I mean, this, this being was so amazing and wow that John was just overwhelmed and overcome. He falls down to worship this angelic being because there's so much of God's glory on this creature. This being was in front of him that it's just, it's overwhelming. And so he bows to worship because the glory of God is on this angel. But the angel said to him in Revelation 19, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And now listen to what the angel says. For the testimony of Jesus, the witness to Jesus, <laughs> Is the spirit of prophecy. You settle into that little verse right there. And what the angel says. And what he's saying is this. Every prophetic utterance. Is about Jesus. It all boils down to Jesus. It all comes back to Jesus. Let me end this uh, first point. With the words of Peter. Spoken to the Jews in the temple. After Jesus' resur uh, re resurrection in Acts chapter 3, he says this, What God foretold by, all, by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. God's word's not going to pass away. We don't re disregard the Old Testament. And the point of all the Old Testament is that God is ready to forgive you are you ready to trust in Jesus? Yeah. Jesus died on the cross for your sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose on the third day, according to the scriptures. And now you must place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not religion, but in Jesus alone, to save you. And if you will do that, you will be saved. Let me urge you to do that today. So we're learning about Jesus in the Old Testament. We we learned that all of the Old Testament laws and prophecies lead us to Jesus. And secondly and lastly, we learn that all of the Old Testament requirements of righteousness are realized in Jesus. All the Old Testament requirements of righteousness are realized in Jesus. Verse 19 and 20, Jesus says in chapter 5 of Matthew, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus wanted to make sure that those who heard his teaching understood that he was not advocating, relaxing or negating or getting rid of the law of God. So he says, whoever relaxes, one source talking about that little phrase is they say, they say this, to, that means to subvert, to do away with, to deprive of authority, whether by precept or act. So somebody comes along and says, hey, don't worry about the law of God, don't worry about what the Old Testament says, don't worry about it. You know, you don't have to pay attention to it. Jesus said, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, he says, and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in importance. Listen, don't be ashamed of God's word in the Old Testament. There's some odd stuff in there because we live in 2019. It was a different culture, different people, different time. There's a lot of things you've got to sink down into and understand what was the frame of reference they were living under. But don't be ashamed of God's word in the Old Testament. Jesus was not ashamed. I want you to think with me for a second. I want you to think about these two groups that Jesus mentions here in verse number 20. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes, his lawyers, experts in the law of God, those who transcribe the word of God. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes 
and this other group, the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to, I want you to come with me on just a short little journey here. Understanding that Jesus reserved some of his sharpest words, some of his sharpest rebukes, some of his most intensive condemnation for the scribes and the Pharisees. And here he says, unless your righteousness exceeds their righteousness, you will not enter the kingdom. You, will, you won't even be part of the kingdom of heaven. What is he teaching? Well, let's, let's look at what Jesus says in Matthew 23. I'm going to read some verses for us because he just starts talking about woe to the scribes and Pharisees and says a bunch of different things about these two groups, groups of people. I want you to understand what he thought about them and how he taught them. Matthew 23, it says, Jesus said, The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. In other words, they're teaching you Moses' law. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but they don't practice it. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. What is he saying? These scribes and Pharisees have got an out and show of religion. They look really good. Y'all look up to them. They teach the word of God. But they don't practice it internally. It's all external for show to get your respect. He goes on in Matthew 23 and says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Boom! Ever had a door slam in your face? So that's what the scribes and Pharisees are doing to you, the common people. He's shut the kingdom of heaven, the door right in your face, for you neither enter yourselves, scribes or Pharisees, and you don't allow those who would enter to go in. Now, you got to understand, this is scandalous to the first century Jewish heart and mind. Jesus, Rabbi, how dare you talk about the, the pinnacle of our examples of what is great and righteous, the scribes and the Pharisees. I mean, these are men that we look up to. These are the elite of the elite. These are the ones who are zealous about your word, who know the law of God in and out. They know everything about it. And you're saying that they're going to hell and shutting the door on everybody else who will come into the kingdom of heaven. I mean, it's just scandalous to hear that. It'd be like somebody coming in here and standing up and saying, hey, your pastor's a dog. He's leading you to hell. Don't listen to him. You might take a little bit of offense. I would. <laughs> he goes on in Matthew 23. Jesus, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel across sea and land to make a single convert, single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, you blind fools, you blind men. Uh, Jesus? Could you be a little bit more seeker sensitive? Because we got some common folks here who really look up to these scribes and Pharisees, and you're not teaching too nice right now. You're playing kind of dirty. You're saying some stuff that's just not right. You can imagine the response of the common people to what Jesus is saying about these scribes and Pharisees, these well respected leaders in the community. He goes on. He had a little more to say. <laughs> Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Matthew 23, 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. And Jesus says, I see right past your veneer. You got all this religion down. You got the talk down. You got the public prayers down. You got it all down. You try to get everybody to do everything what you want them to do, conform to what you want them to do. But I see the junk on the inside of you. And I do not approve. He goes on to say, Matthew 23, 27, and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and the prince, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Well, that's a nice visual. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. How dare you say I'm full of lawlessness? They would have responded. We're teachers of the law. We implement the law. What are you talking about? And Jesus says, I see your heart, and it's full 
eternal. <clears throat> Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tomb of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, Well, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would have not taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. And thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. <laughs> I mean, he absolutely takes out a verbal whip and smacks the stink out of his guys. <laughs> I mean, it was completely countercultural. Some people want to disregard the Old Testament because it offends people. I think Jesus would show up and say, well, that offends me. That offends me. And so who were these tribes of Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees were the common everyday men of the community who were very zealous about making sure everyone lived in compliance with Mosaic law, as well as the oral traditions of the fathers. They believed in the angels, eternal life, judgment, and blessing after death. Some also served in the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling class, okay? Ruling class. Scribes, and I'm going to quote from a source. I mean, you can just look this up and find it anywhere. Have a little record of site. And I'm quoting from one now about scribes. Scribes were often associated with a sect of the Pharisees, although not all Pharisees were scribes. They were teachers of the people and interpreters of the law. They were widely respected by the community because of their knowledge, their dedication, their outward appearance of law keeping. The scribes went beyond interpretation of scripture, however, and added many man-made traditions to what God had said. They became professionals as spelling out the letter of the law while ignoring the spirit behind it. Things became so bad that the regulations and traditions the scribes added to the law were considered more important than the law itself. You ever been in a church where man-made interpretations and additions to God's word become more important? Stylistic things become more important than what God actually taught, said? You ever been around people that uh, claim the name of Christ and yet there's everything else in their life that's more important than Jesus? Same thing. Oh yes, I love Jesus, but you can just tell by how they live, how they talk, how they act, etc. That really, it's not Jesus. That's how the core and center of it makes them who they are. Okay? The religious leaders were really good at making a show about their righteousness. But Jesus pointed out their hypocrisy. So we come back to our text here and we're like, oh, Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments teaches others to do the same to call, call least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great the kingdom of heaven. Oh, and by the way, um, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't even see the kingdom of heaven. And then we know from other teachings that Jesus is saying the scribes and Pharisees are not actually fulfilling the verse 19. They're keeping people out of heaven. And here the ultimate pinnacle of example of people that are righteous. Are righteous. And Jesus is saying, you've got to have greater righteousness than them. And by the way, just as an aside, we're talking about, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, starting in verse 21, we're going to start uh, looking at Jesus' teaching based on the law of God and bringing it into the, 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 the new covenant. And he's going to be teaching that he wants us to honor the Lord from the heart and how we obey God's word, not just with external religion. So he's kind of setting the stage for that right now. And then he's going to go into showing by example after example of what this looks like to really honor God from the heart and live it out. Let me just ask you, are you putting on a show of external religion without heart devotion to Jesus? What is Jesus' point? We're almost done. Chad, ask you a question. What do you think Jesus' point here? In verse number 20. When he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter, you cannot be in the kingdom of heaven. What do you think he's talking about there? What do you think he's saying? He's saying that nobody, nobody can live up to the standard of God's righteousness. Because God's standard exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so you can't just get to the level of the scribes and Pharisees in your religion, and then you're in. 
It has to exceed that. Why? Because God has a higher standard. It's called perfection. And we all feel what the first century Jewish people would have responded. I can't do that. I, I can't do that. I've already not done that. I've already sinned. My righteousness does not exceed the holiest people around me. It doesn't even come close. God, could you lower the standard just a little bit and make it maybe just like this much righteousness and I'll shoot for it, I'll go for it, and I'll try to honor you and then you'll be pleased and then I can come into the kingdom of heaven and Jesus says, no. Your righteousness is never, ever going to be good enough because the standard is absolute perfection. And that is Jesus' point. The righteousness that God requires comes from God himself through faith in Jesus. Write down the last point today in your notes. God is the standard of righteousness. He's the standard of righteousness fulfilled, in, which is fulfilled in Jesus. And God is our provider of righteousness and by grace through Jesus. By grace through Jesus. Salvation is by grace alone and by, by grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone. The last scripture I want to share with you today is 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. It says, and because of him, that's God the Father, because of God the Father, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast no word. Did you catch that? God sent Jesus, who became to us righteousness. Think about it. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. As we come to the conclusion this morning, I want you to think about the standard that God has created, which is perfection, and the solution that God has provided is Jesus. Jesus is the perfect righteousness of God, and it is available for you. God doesn't need your righteousness to save you. He's provided Jesus to save you. Let's stand together and let's pray. As we move toward our time of response, God has...